September 3rd, 1892. Dear Martha, After I talked with Mama, I needed to get off by myself and figure out what was making me feel like my shoes were on the wrong foot. I asked myself, What is it? This is everything I've hoped for. Mama and Papa are alive. We're on our own land. Daniel is part of our family. We have a new baby and she's adorable. So why do I feel like something still needs to be done? I puzzled about those things for a long time. There's a big flat rock that's near the spring not too far from the house. It is the perfect place to be by myself. After a while, I figured it out, and coming up with the answers was like scratching an itch that I could finally reach. I had come through a journey, but it was not complete. I had met people along the way that had taken me in or helped me in some way. Those people meant something to me even though I might have just known them for a little while. I wanted to let them know that I had found Mama and Pop. I needed to let them know. For some reason, my life felt like a circle that was still open and needed closing. Wanda Watson had said, I'd love to know you got to where you're going. That was it. I needed to let folks know that I was finally home with my family. I spent the last three days writing letters and drawing pictures. I wrote to Mrs. Plum and thanked her for taking care of me while I was sick. I said I was sorry I had to run away, but I was afraid of being put in an orphanage and never seeing Mama and Pop again. I told her that I finally found Mama and Pop alive. I sent the letter to Mrs. Plum's quarantine station, Gainesville, Florida. I wrote to Dr. Winkleplek and thanked her for letting me sleep in her brother's feed store and for the balloon ride. I included a drawing of the balloon with me, Ethel, and her in the gondola. I didn't know where else to send it, so I sent it to the feed store in care of her brother, Carl Winkleplek. I wrote to Carlene Green and her family. I thanked Mrs. Green for taking me in and making me feel welcome and for a pretty pink dress with a white pinafore. I told them about Verna and Jimbo and how I had to run away. That was the longest letter because I had to tell them just about everything until now. I drew a picture of me and Carlene bathing Freddie and Ethelbert. I asked Carlene to be my, my Florida pen pal. I hope she writes back. I wrote to Wanda Watson and thanked her for being so kind to me and Daniel. I thanked her for the delicious fried fish and for the story about the firefly and for the clothes and the boat. I told her that all of the people I met, I loved her most of all. I drew a picture of her, me, and Daniel fishing in her creek. I asked her to please tell Joe that we thank him for helping us get away in his cotton wagon. I sent it to Wanda Watson, General Delivery, Orange Springs. I am crossing my fingers that it gets to her. I wrote to Susanna and Massimo and thanked them for letting Daniel and me take care of the elephants. I told them we would never have made it without their help. I asked them to thank Marie and Elmer and Carl Ringling. I sent them a drawing of Susanna riding Babette at the front of the parade. I told them that someday, if Mama and Pop would allow it, Daniel and I might like to come back and work with them again. I sent their letter to Baraboo, Wisconsin, the home of the Ringling Circus. I wrote to John Philip Sosa and sent a picture of him giving me and Daniel the silver dollars. I told him that I thought his marching band was the best band ever. I sent his letter to Washington, D.C. I wrote to Miss Melman and thanked her for taking us in and for the tickets this for the steamer and the extra money and the clothes. I told her that I thought she was the best teacher and friend. I told her to please thank Mr. Milkelson for me. I said, P.S. Do you have something you want to tell me yet? Ha <laughs> ha, love Teddy. It took me days to write all the letters and do the drawings, but as I wrote, I felt the circle closing little by little. I began to feel like the old me. That's a good thing. Now there's just one more thing I have to do. I don't want to do it, but I have to. Love, Teddy. October 18, 1892. There, Martha. I got your letters. They made me miss you even more. You will always be my best friend. I feel like you've been on this entire journey with me. Yes, school started for us too. We have a brand new school. There are nine families who own land near us, and all of the children, including me and Daniel, go to the North Dade Rural School. We're all together, and our teacher is a man. I was shocked on the first day of school. He is nice, though, and I think he's a good teacher. His name is Amos Weathers, but we call him Mr. Weathers. Daniel about died when he hurt when he had to go to school, and he didn't want to go. He used to be he is he's used to being on his own, I guess. I thought it was going to be a big problem, but Mama had a talk with him. I don't know what she, all she said because I wasn't with them, but I. But he told me later that she said, I'll make a deal with you. The first day you don't learn something at school, you don't have to go anymore. Well, Dad did it. Daniel is an excellent student and you should hear him read. Mr. Weathers said he is a very intelligent student. 
Daniel and I ride Swift to school every morning and back home in the evening. The best thing happened. Mr. Weathers allowed the two of us to go to the Carter's house raising. We had to miss a week of school, but Mama told Mr. Weathers we would finish all of our lessons. We packed a little wagon Daniel and I bought from the Colstein with all of Pop's woodworking tools and extra food supplies. We packed our big wagon that still has the canvas on it with everything we would need to sleep outdoors for a week. We tied Girlie behind because we couldn't leave her home alone and Pop rode Gabriel. Daniel let me ride swift. He said for me to take a turn and he'd drive for Mama. Mama said, You sure are a blessing, Daniel Bulldane. I think I might keep you. As we pulled out, Pop said, We've got enough stuff to be heading out on another journey. The week at the Carter's house raising was so much fun as I was hoping it would be. Most of the same families came to help out, so once again we had a huge circle of wagons. I got to see Minnie and Haley, Jasper Lowe and Porter's Captain Walsh and his sons, Miss Melman and Mr. Milkerson, Miss Emily and her husband Martin. Someone came up behind me and said, I got your letter, Bodane. It was Travis Lark. I said, yeah, are you ready, Lark, or are you scared? I'll let you get back out of it if you don't think you're up to it, he said. I ain't scared. I beat you last time and I'm going to cream you this time. You don't stand the chance. Your kite is mine, I said. You're on. In between all the work and the chores and the running errands for our parents and the laughter and the games, Travis and I each found the time to make a kite. Minnie and Haley helped me and Jasper and Daniel helped Travis. This time we were ready for them. Our kite was beautiful with pelicans and waves and a setting sun. We named it the Florida Bell too. We coated our string with glue and glass dust and let it dry overnight. Two can play at this string cutting game. The next day, the crowd gathered to watch. As I expected, the boy's kite was ugly. They named it the Kite Killer. Minnie held my kite while I ran with the string. Daniel held Travis's kite while Travis ran with the string. Soon, both kites were launched high in the air. I crossed Travis's line with my line. I sawed my line. He sawed his line. The crowd screamed. The tension grew. Suddenly, the Florida Bell too was cut free and sailed away, disappearing into the sky. Everyone cheered and Travis took a dramatic bow. I screamed, How did you do that, you rascal, rascal in you? Rats! Rats and double rats! He said, That's just it. I used a double string. He laughed like only Travis Lark can laugh. Vexation! Development, ferocious vexation. I'll get him back, I swear I will. I'll write more soon, I promise. Love, Teddy. October 28, 1892. Dear Martha, I've been reading your letters every chance I get. We are two writing maniacs, aren't we? Please don't ever stop writing me. I still can't believe you're going to get to come for a visit over the holidays. What a dream come true. And yes, I'll introduce you to everyone I've been talking about all these months. Daniel especially wants to meet you. He's seen me writing so many letters to you, and he's dying to know what you look like. School is going well. Another school, North Dade Circuit School, came to spend two days with our school. We are pen pals with them, so we finally get to meet our pen pals. Their school is 12 miles away. On Friday, we had a spelling bee, and I won the word consternation. Mr. Weathers gave Daniel a book to read, and guess what it is? The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. So every minute he's not writing Swift or doing some chore for Pop, he got his nose in the book. I never got to finish the story, so when he's through, I'm going to read it too. I have a surprise to tell you. I got a package in the mail yesterday, and there was a letter with the package. Rather than telling you about it, I'm going to copy the letter here. You'll know why. Dear Teddy, you can't imagine my surprise upon receiving the package you sent that contained my gold bracelet. I sat in astonishment for a long while, staring, unbelieving. I was looking at a treasure that had been lost some 25 years earlier on an outing to Fanning Springs. Foolishly, I wore the bracelet while swimming and it slipped off my arm and was lost to me. While we looked and looked, it could not be found in the sand at the bottom. I left the springs heartbroken, this special gift lost forever, I thought. That bracelet represents something very dear to me. My husband, the love of my life, had the bracelet inscribed and gave it to me for my 35th birthday, August 13th, in 1862. 
As I'm sure you know, the inscription reads, To Athelia Tomlinson from her loving husband, Joseph, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. My Joseph was lost in the war between the states and at the Battle of Vicksburg in 1863. I miss him to this day, and so when I held the gold bracelet again, I brought it back many wonderful memories of a thoughtful and gentle man who died at such a young age. Thank you for sharing the wonderful story of how you fanned for treasure at Fanning Spring. If I known about fanning years ago, perhaps I would have found my bracelet in private treasure as well. Thank you for sharing the incredible story of your journey, Teddy, all the way from Mississippi to South Florida. I was again astonished to learn of the twists and turns your path took before you were reunited with your parents. My daughter, Alice Tomlinson Edisu, told me of meeting you at the Yellow Fever Quarantine Station outside of Gainesville. She and I have discussed the bracelet, and she agrees with my decision. My bracelet, like my dear husband, was lost to me years ago. A gold bracelet was found by an enter enterprising girl who was looking for treasure. This brave girl wore it on her journey through losing her baby brother, scumbing through yellow fever, being separated from her parents, having to live on her own, and surviving by her wits. The gold bracelet was a source of comfort to her, a reminder of just what you can find if you look hard enough. And so, dear Teddy, it would give me great pleasure to know that you are still wearing the bracelet as you go through life. Please receive it as my gift to you. Your friend, Althea Tomlinson. Martha, I'm wearing the bracelet now. I'm never going to take it off. Once, I felt like I lost myself, but now, I feel like I found the old Teddy Bodine again. Love, Teddy. Arthur's Note Teddy Bodine is an imaginary girl I made up in order to tell the story. Although she is fiction, there were hundreds if not thousands of girls just like her who came to Florida during the late 1800s. Each girl would have had her own creative story to tell. My own grandmother, Rebecca Lord Lenora Nix, crossed into primitive Florida in a covered wagon just about the same time as my fictional character, Teddy Bodine. She too lost her little brother and watched her father and the other men bury him across a creek on the bank of a little island. It was a scene she was never to forget in all her 97 years. When she grew up, my grandmother had eight children of her own and many grandchildren. She told detailed stories of her life in early Florida, some of the very things she did. Some of her adventures, some of her heartbreaks, and even a few of her recipes are woven throughout the story. As a kid, I loved to read. It's been said many times before, but reading a great book is like stepping into someone else's life for a while. We cease to be ourselves, and suddenly, we meet up with new locations, friends, villains, and heroes. Now, as an adult, I love to write the kinds of stories I enjoyed reading when I was growing up. Some will ask, how did you come up with this story? The idea of a novel about a girl crossing Florida in a covered wagon and getting separated from her parents rushed into my mind all at once. I had a general idea where things were headed, but the specific plot details developed each day as I was writing. Teddy told her own story in my imagination. I saw it like a movie and wrote down what I saw. I hope you have enjoyed reading her adventure. Historical Note In 1892, much of the state of Florida was a wild, undeveloped wilderness. The beaches had few houses or hotels. Many of them were pristine stretches of sand, sand dunes, and sea oats. The state of Florida was happy to welcome pioneer families and land, even beachfront property was cheap. The governor and legislator were eager to see agriculture flourish and progress arrive. At the time of the story, the railroad had not yet made its way down into Florida rather than Daytona Beach and Tampa. The development of Henry Flagler's elaborate hotels and resorts and the staging of the Spanish-American War a few days later changed that. By the end of the century, Florida had a structure of railroads and highways making progress inevitable. Great care went into the research for this book. I have tried to strive for accuracy. If there are discrepancies, they are unintentional. Certain encounters, such as Teddy's meeting with the great entrepreneur Carl Ringling and the world-famous composer John Philip Sosa, are simply fiction. I have attempted to recreate what life was like for pioneer families who migrated to the state of Florida during the last part of the 19th century.